Welcome to part one of our series on courage. Thank you for taking time to watch this message. I think the content is going to be really helpful for you as we enter a new season this fall, and for some of us, new challenges. Unfortunately, we had technical challenges with the live stream this past Sunday, so the following presentation will be audio only. Well, um, we are super excited about a new school year. I get fired up at this time of the year because I think it's an incredible opportunity to start fresh. And I need fresh beginnings. Are you like me? Like, I need a fresh start. I need new beginnings. I need to feel like, you know, the slate has been wiped clean. This is going to be a new season. This season is going to be better, right? Because if I look back, sometimes the previous season can be a little bit exhausting. If we look back, we get a little bit discouraged. If we look back, we get a little bit depressed. And so I need to look forward. I need to look ahead. I need to be excited about this new year. And you have been through an incredible couple of years. You have had a difficult season. Maybe you're sitting here today and you're like, yeah, I'm kind of excited about this new season. I'm kind of excited about what's ahead, but I'm a a little bit daunted also. I'm a little bit intimidated. I'm a little bit uncertain because, you know, what lies ahead could be difficult. I've just been through a difficult couple of years. Maybe these last couple of years created a lot of uncertainty for you. Maybe these last couple of years created a lot of insecurity for you. Maybe during these last couple of years, you just felt like you were taking hit after hit after hit. And now as you look forward and there's a new opportunity, you recognize that with this new opportunity will also come some new challenges. And summer's great, right? Summer's awesome. It's a nice chance to sit back and relax. And, you know, we all get to coast just a little bit during the summer. But now fall comes and we're gearing back up. And for some of us, we're not sure if we just have the energy because we have just, we are tired from the last two years. We are discouraged from the last two years. Maybe, in fact, you feel a little bit like this gentleman who um, was asked to provide some additional information to his insurance company because of a medical claim that he had filed. And um, his response was this. He said, I am writing in response to your request for additional information. In block number three of the accident reporting form, I put poor planning as the cause of my accident. You said in your letter that I should explain more and I trust that the following details are sufficient. I am a bricklayer by trade. On the day of the accident, I was working alone on the roof of a new six-story building. When I completed my work, I discovered that I had about 500 pounds of bricks left over. Rather than carry the bricks down by hand, I decided to lower them in a barrel by using a pulley, which fortunately was attached to the side of the building at the sixth floor. Securing the rope at ground level, I went up to the roof, swung the barrel out, and loaded the bricks into it. Then I went back to the ground and untied the rope, holding it tightly to ensure a slow descent of the 500 pounds of bricks. You will note in block number 11 of the accident reporting form that I weigh 135 pounds. (laughs) Due to my surprise at being jerked off the ground so suddenly, I lost my presence of mind and forgot to let go of the rope. Needless to say, I proceeded at a rather rapid rate of speed up the side of the building. In the vicinity of the third floor, I met the barrel coming down. This explains the fractured skull and the broken collarbone. Slowed only slightly, I continued my rapid ascent, not stopping until the fingers of my right hand were two knuckles deep into the pulley. Fortunately, by this time, I had regained my presence of mind and was able to hold tightly to the rope six stories above the ground in spite of my pain. At approximately the same time, however, the barrel of bricks hit the ground and the bottom fell out of the barrel. Devoid of the weight of the bricks, the barrel now weighed approximately 50 pounds. I refer you again to my weight in block number 11. As you might imagine, I began a rapid descent down the side of the building. In the vicinity of the third floor, I met the barrel coming up. (laughs) This accounts for the two fractured ankles, the lacerations on my legs and lower body. This encounter with the barrel slowed me enough to lessen my injuries when I fell onto the pile of bricks. And fortunately, only three vertebrae were cracked. I am sorry to report, however, that as I lay there on the bricks in pain, unable to move, and watching the barrel six stories above me, I again lost my presence of mind and let go of the rope. (laughs) You feel like that sometimes in life? 
You feel like you just keep getting beat up, right? And uh, it just feel like I just need a break. And, and as I have been really thinking and praying over the last three or four months about what to start this fall with, what we're going to talk about here for the next four weeks as we kick off this new season, I have really been hearing a lot of y'all's stories about just feeling tired, just feeling like, you know, um, I, don't, I shouldn't feel this way. I don't know why we, we always preface this, like, I shouldn't feel this way, but I just feel tired. Tired. I feel like there's something about the last couple of years that has exhausted me. I don't know if it's been COVID and all the concern around COVID. I don't know if it's been how that's affected uh, the economy and the markets. I don't know if that's how it's affected my, my job, my business, my company, my industry. I don't know if that's affected my relationships um, at home and with, with, with distant relatives. I don't know if it's the politics and all of the division and the conflict. I don't know, but I just feel kind of exhausted. And the reality as we look into the next four to six months, as we look into this next season ahead of us, um, there's still uncertainty. There's still a financial roller coaster ahead of us. There is uh, foreign entanglements. We don't know which ways that some of these tensions are going to go. And for a lot of us, we feel like we could be riding into a storm. And so there are opportunities, but we recognize that with those opportunities come some challenges. And so I would like to talk a little bit today about what I believe we need as a people to move through this next season and to not allow discouragement to take hold, not allow discouragement to overwhelm us, not to be pulled down into the challenges of life, but to rise above and to move through the storm that might be ahead. And I think a great example, a great story for us to start with as we kick off this series today is to look at a story from the nation of Israel about a year after they left Egypt. Now, if you, uh, if you know some of the stories from the Hebrew Bible, you might remember that the nation of Israel had um, started with Joseph going to Egypt and then the rest of his family followed. And then fast forward 400 years after this family had been in Egypt, they're now a nation, a people, probably around 75,000 people. And um, they had been enslaved in Egypt. And God, through Moses, led them out of slavery and led them to Mount Sinai. And there he made a covenant with them. He established a relationship with them. And the very first thing that God said to them is that, you should love the Lord your God with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your strength. It wasn't, it wasn't the Ten Commandments. That's not how God started the relationship. God started the relationship by saying, I am your God, you are my people, and this is going to be a love-based relationship. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart. Well, about a year goes by, and in that next year, there are 10 different occurrences, which means about every six weeks that Israel completely forgot who God was, completely forgot how trustworthy God was, and, and did something absolutely boneheaded. Maybe you can relate if you have children. You do think six weeks? Six weeks would be a really great stretch, right? Six minutes is kind of where we're at in our family. But about every six weeks, Israel would just sort of like literally lose their mind, like lose all memory of who God was, his love, his faithfulness, his goodness, and his greatness. And they would like, oh, I don't know, make a golden calf and begin to worship the golden calf instead. And so 10 different times, God has to say to the nation of Israel, no, 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 I'm over here, I'm over here. You know, attention. I am your God. Love the Lord your God with your whole heart. And so about a year after they leave Egypt, they've been camping at Mount Sinai for most of that time. And God says, okay, I'm ready to lead you into the promised land. The promised land. The land that I have already promised that I would give you. So Israel packs up. They begin this journey it's about 300 miles or so. They get a little bit more than halfway there after a few weeks of traveling. And then um, God 
says that you're going to send some spies into the land. You're going to kind of scout it out. And today we're going to look at this story and what we can learn and how it can apply to my life and yours for this next season ahead. I want to start by looking at this verse from Numbers 14, and then we're going to skip back a little bit to Numbers 13. But God says, because my servant Caleb has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly, I will bring him into the land he went to and his descendants will inherit it. These two character qualities, I think, are necessary for you and I as we move into this next season. A season with great opportunity, but also challenges ahead. We will need to have a different spirit and we will need to be wholehearted. This is what God admired in Caleb. Can you imagine God looking at you and saying, this is what I admire about Marino. This is what I admire about Rick. This is what I admire about Lauren. How cool would that be that God would name you specifically and say, he had a different spirit and he's wholehearted. And And when God said wholehearted, that echoed right back to what Israel had been told to love the Lord your God with your whole heart. So today we're going to talk a little bit about what it means to be wholehearted. But first we're going to back up a little bit and we're going to go to how Israel chose these 12 spies to go into the land. And I'm going to read some names here. And um, we're, we don't usually, you know, the, the Old Testament, sometimes you get into some of this and you're like, man, I don't know how to pronounce these things. It's a little bit difficult, but hang with me for a minute because it's relevant and we're going to move through it pretty quickly here. But the Lord spoke to Moses saying, send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving. This is important to hang on to as we go through the rest of the story, because God did not say, uh, send some spies into the land to see if, there's no if in this, to see if you can take the land. God is saying, I am giving you the land. What do you have to do to receive a gift? Nothing. Put your hands out. Receive the gift, right? So this has nothing to do with you. This has nothing to do with your talent, your ability, your charisma, your giftedness. This has nothing to do with you. When God gives you a gift, it is God saying, I am giving you. And so God says, I'm giving you this land. So just just receive it. So you're just going to basically scout it out so that you can come back and you can be so encouraged because you're going to see some amazing, amazing things. So I'm giving this to the people of Israel. From each tribe of their fathers, you shall send a man, everyone a chief among them. So there's 12 families, all right? So, uh, you know, there's, there's, Joseph had 11 brothers, so you've got 12 tribes. And so they go in and they say, okay, each one of these families is probably, say, between five and 10,000 people now. So each one of them is a leader among leaders. We're going to select from each tribe one person. So Moses sent them from the wilderness. Wait, back up. All right. Okay, I guess we're good. Sorry. So Moses sent them from the wilderness of Paran, according to the command of the Lord, all of them men who were heads of the people of Israel. And these were their names. Here's where it gets exciting. From the tribe of Reuben, Shamua the son of Zachar. We're going to go through these fast. From the tribes of Simeon, Japhat, the son of Hori. From the tribe of Judah, Caleb, the son of Japuna. From the tribe of Issachar, Ilgal, the son of Joseph. From the tribe of Ephraim, Hoshea, the son of Nun. From the tribe of Benjamin, Palti, the son of Raphu. From the tribe of Zebulun, Gadiel, the son of Sodai. From the tribe of Joseph, that is from the tribe of Manasseh, Gadi, the son of Susi. From the tribe of Dan, Aniel, the son of Gamali. From the tribe of Asher, Sether, the son of Michael. From the tribe of Naphtali, Nabi, the son of Vosi. From the tribe of Gad, Guel, the son of Machi, these were the names of the men that Moses sent to spy out the land. 
And Moses called Hosea, the son of Nun, Joshua. Okay, so here's a list of some of these names, okay? These are 10 names, and I want you to look at these names real carefully. And if you see your name on the screen, I want you to raise your hand. If you named any of your children one of these names, raise your hand. Really? There's some winners up here. Okay, if, you, if you're related to anyone, if you work with anyone with one of these names, not so much, right? Very interesting, 12 were selected, all of them heads, chiefs, leaders of their respective families. So you've got five to 10,000 people and they say, who among us do we respect enough? Who is kind of like, so the age of these guys, by the way, I think it's a little bit relevant for our culture because they're probably around the age of 40. This is just guessing based on what we know about Joshua and Caleb at the time. And uh, so I want you to think in our culture, we would think like, who made it on the 40 under 40 list, right? Who, who's that person who is like, he's just got it or she's just got it. She's got that leadership thing. She's got that charisma. She's got that everybody wants to be around her. People want to follow him. These are the people. And yet, we don't, talk about them today. They're sort of one hit wonders. They peaked, they peaked and they're never heard from again. But these other two, Joshua and Caleb, how many Joshua's or Caleb's in the room? Do we have anybody that knows a Joshua or Caleb? Do we have anybody who named their kids Joshua or Caleb? Yeah, pretty crazy, right? So what separates the two, Joshua and Caleb, for being names that we use all the time today from all these others that are never spoken of again. They are, they are never mentioned after Numbers chapter 14 because after Numbers chapter 14, God said, nope, you're done. But Joshua and Caleb had a future. In fact, they would go on to be leaders in the nation of Israel for the rest of their lives, another 45 years. So so it's really crazy because um, what happens is they go into the land, these 12 spies, and they see some pretty incredible things. They um, They see incredible fruit. And they see a land that just as God had promised was flowing with milk and honey. In fact, they take some grapes and the grapes are so big that they have to put the clump of grapes on a pole and the pole is carried by two men. This is how amazing the land is. But the land has also got some challenges. And what we see here as we move forward, what distinguishes the 10 from the two is the perspective with which they saw the opportunities and the challenges that lay in front of them. And I think that it's really fascinating because they were gone for 40 days and we're not told very much at all about what they did and what they saw in those 40 days. It's just a few verses. But we're told that they they went to different regions of the land of Israel. They saw different people groups. They saw different fruit and all of that, but together they're traveling as a group of 12 the entire time. And, and when they are finished with this journey, 10 come back discouraged. And they say, we cannot do it. We just cannot take the land. And two come back with courage. And they say, We can do this because God has given us the land. And and I wonder, as these 12, this is just me wondering, the 12 are traveling together, they're camping together, they're walking together, and at what point do the factions begin to develop in the group, right? Like when they left, I imagine that all 12 of them were pretty open-minded. But then as they see different things and as they experience different things, some of them begin to develop a little bit of a negative attitude and some of them develop a little bit of a positive attitude. And at some point that settles out to 10 and two. 
That's all we know is kind of the end of the 40 day journey that they are in Israel. But I'm really curious about like, how did that happen? How did that develop? What did their conversations sound like? At what point were the negative guys, you know, outweighing the voices of the positive guys? And, and what did those conversations sound like around the campfire at night? Because what's crazy is they all saw the same things. They all experienced the same land. But they saw it through a different lens. Some of them saw it through the lens of my God is so big. I saw him split the Red Sea. I saw him deliver us from Pharaoh. Nothing can stop my God. And some, of, some saw it through the lens of these are really big problems. These are really big people. This is a really big challenge. And it turns out that your faith your faith, meaning how you see God, your faith is a lens through which you see the world. You see the world through a lens that is your faith. It affects what you see when you get up in the morning. It affects the relationships and how you interact with your family. It affects your attitude, your mentality, your resilience in the time of storm, your resilience in facing difficulties. And so there's a distinct difference between the different spirit that Caleb had and the wholeheartedness that he had from the rest of the 10. See, the reality is that when, you're, when your heart is full of God, there's no room for doubt and discouragement to creep in. The idea is that his, he was so full of, he was so wholehearted in his faith and his belief in God, that there wasn't room for anything else. There's another passage a little bit later in the Old Testament where it talks about one of the kings of Israel who followed after David. And, and when he's first introduced, scripture says, he did everything that was right, but he was not wholehearted. And later his story ends with tragedy. You see, it's not about our behavior. It's not about what we do. Man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. And he wants our hearts to be full of him. All right, let's come back to our story about the spies. So Moses sent them out, right? Moses sent them out to spy out the land of Canaan. And he said to them, go up into the Negeb and go up into the hill country and see what the land is and whether the people who dwell in it are strong or weak, whether they are few or many, and whether the land that they dwell in is good or bad, and whether the cities that they dwell in are in camps or strongholds, and whether the land is rich or poor, and whether there are trees in it or not, be of good courage. Moses is telling them before they leave, don't get discouraged. Don't get sidetracked. Don't get overwhelmed. Be of good courage and bring some of the fruit of the land. Now, this time was the season of the first ripe grapes. And so off they go to explore the land and to see what God had already promised to give to the nation of Israel. And at the end of 40 days, they returned from spying out the land. And they came to Moses and Aaron and all of the congregation of the people of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. They brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him, we came to the land which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey. And this is its fruit. In other words, it's all good news. It's amazing. And then one of them says, <clears throat> However, you ever been in those meetings? However, however, I do have to point some things out, right? However, I don't think this is going to go well. 
Now, here's a reason why the howevers pop up a lot of time. A lot of the time, we confuse the purpose to which God has called us with the plan that we have developed. And when we see that our plan has problems, we begin to doubt the purpose to which God has called us. Does that make sense? You see, the nation of Israel, these spies in particular, these 10 spies in particular, they could only imagine taking the land of Canaan in one way, the way that they had seen armies function in the past. And in the past, they had seen that powerful armies triumphed over less powerful armies and they're moving into this land and they saw powerful people. And yet, just a year before, they had seen God defeat Pharaoh's army on their behalf. But they had forgotten that. That was yesterday and now I'm, now I'm looking at today. Now I'm looking at a new storm. Now I'm looking at a new challenge and I don't know. They had no idea that God was just gonna say, oh, hey, that first town, Jericho, you're just gonna march around in circles and then on the seventh day, you're gonna blow your horns and then I'm going to take care of the battle. But see, they didn't understand God's plan and we often don't see God's plan. And so we write our own plan. And honestly, there's nothing wrong with having a plan. You should have a plan. But what, what is the saying? That there is no plan that withstands the first shot of battle? Or how did Mike Tyson say it? Everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face, right? So it's good to have a plan. But then you get punched in the face and you're like, oh, oh, all of a sudden we, we don't have a plan anymore, which means now we begin to doubt God's purpose. However, however means that when the plan looks impossible, we begin to doubt God's purpose. This happens in our own lives. This happens in our own church and our own organization, right? We had a plan a few years ago. We were like, we're going to buy some land. We're going to build a building. Man, in no time, we're going to be, you know, ready to go. And then real estate prices went through the roof. And we're looking at opportunities that are disappearing. And you think, oh, no. Well, maybe God didn't call us to St. John's County. Maybe God doesn't have a purpose for us to share the love of God in this community. Maybe God, no. God's purpose is locked in. Our plans need to adapt to God's purpose. Now, if you're sitting on some land, let's talk after the service. <laughs> I'm not saying we don't still like the plan, okay? I'm not announcing there's any. I'm just saying that we sometimes get so attached to a plan and when the plan doesn't start to work out the way that we thought it would, we begin to doubt God's purpose. God's purpose for you is the same. And in just a minute, I'm gonna to talk to you about what God's specific purpose is for you because I think you can know what God's purpose is. I think you can be confident in what God's purpose is for your life. And I think you could have courage for this season ahead because God has a plan for you. But it means you need to be wholehearted. It means you need to have a different spirit. It means you can't be like the other 10. You have to stand alone. You have to have a different voice, a different spirit. When the, when the discouragement creeps in, you have to say, no, 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 there's no room for that. My heart is full. I am wholehearted. But the voices of discouragement will be loud and convincing. And the voice of, dis of discouragement spoke up in front of the nation of Israel. And the voice of discouragement said, however, the people who dwell in the land are strong and their cities are fortified and they're very large. And besides, we saw the descendants of Anak there. Now, Anak was a, a giant people, okay? You think back to like Goliath and the Philistines. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the Negev the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites. There's a bunch of ites. Everywhere there's ites. 
You've got ice in your life. You've got challenges in your life. You've got overwhelming prospects that speak discouragement. They dwell in the country and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and all along the Jordan. In other words, everywhere you go, there's a problem. But Caleb, Caleb, who was of a different spirit and wholehearted, Caleb speaks up. And he said, let us go up at once. (laughs) Like now, today. No, we don't need time. Right now, there's no better time than right now. Let us go at once and occupy it. For we are well able to overcome it. We are well able. I want you to say that this week. We are well able. Because of you, because of your talent, because of your charisma, because of you've got no Because God is giving you a gift. Because God has a purpose that he wants to work out through your life. You are well able. But you cannot be like the 10 whose names you don't even remember. You must be of a different spirit and wholehearted. And then the men who had gone up with him said, we're not able to go up against the people for they are stronger than we are. So they brought to the people of Israel a bad report of the land that they had spied out saying, the land through which we have gone to spy out, it's a land that devours its inhabitants. Now they just told us about all the people that lived there and how well all these people were doing. They're strong and they're able-bodied and all. But, and then at the same time, like, but it devours the inhabitants. You know, we can't even, if, if, the, if we could overcome the people, the land itself is hostile. The land itself would devour us. And all the people that we saw in it are of great height. These people have tall privilege. Because most people with tall privilege, it's a real thing, Right? The rest of us are like, don't discount that tall privilege. But the nation of Israel looks at this and they're like, this is, this is not even a fair fight. And there we saw the Nephilim. These are the sons of Anak. These are the giants. These are like Goliath who come from the Nephilim. And we seem to ourselves like grasshoppers. And this is fascinating. And so we seemed to them, which means they had either gone up to these people and asked them, how do you perceive me? Or they had done what you and I do all the time, which is they had made assumptions about how other people perceived them. But this is is the worst part. Then all the congregation raised a loud cry and the people wept that night. All of their faith in God had been destroyed. All of their confidence in God had been eroded. All of their courage had been stripped away because someone spoke discouraging words to them. What's discouraging you today? What is discouraging you? What's robbing you of your courage for this season ahead? I want you to think about that. And I want you to to take that to God. And I want you to have a conversation with God about what it is that is discouraging you. Maybe it's this past season. Maybe it's all that you've been through. Maybe it's the strain that has been on your finances, on your relationships, on your job, your career. I don't know what it is, but what is discouraging you? And I want you to bring that before God. And I want you to have a conversation with God about it but I do not want you to let it into your heart. Don't let it into your heart. Your heart needs to be full of faith, wholehearted. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and all of your strength and all of your mind. And as you move into this season, and you're having this conversation with God, I want you to ask him the question, God, what is your purpose for me? What is your purpose for me? Now, if you're here today and you're a Jesus follower, if you're someone who says, I've surrendered my life to God, 
then I can tell you with clarity what God's purpose is for your life. If you're here this morning and and you have lots of questions or maybe you're watching online and someone just sent you this link and you're like, I don't know that I would call myself a Jesus follower. In fact, I might even call myself a skeptic. I might even say that I'm someone who's a bit cynical about religion and faith and all of these things. Then, Then I can't tell you, I can't speak to you for what your purpose is. Maybe you feel confident in that and maybe you're still asking questions. I think a great starter prayer for you might be, God, help me to see as you see. Help me to see through your lens. Give me an understanding of what my purpose might be in this world. But if you're a believer, if you're someone who says, I've surrendered my life to Jesus, I want to follow after him, then your purpose is clear. Your purpose in this life above everything else. Maybe God's given you other purposes. Maybe God's gonna use you to do some phenomenal things. Maybe God's gonna use you to cure cancer. Maybe God's gonna use you to help us colonize Mars. Maybe God's gonna help you, you know, do amazing things for your HOA. God bless you. (laughs) Dream big. But bigger than any of that, God has called you to inspire other people to follow Jesus. This is your purpose. And we all live that out differently, right? Some of us do it working in the church. Some of us do it working in the local hospital. Some of us do it working in the local school system. We all live that out differently, but God has given you above anything else You think about all the things that you want to accomplish this fall. You think about everything that's on your to-do list. At the top of that list is to inspire people to follow Jesus. Don't confuse your plan and how well your plan is going and what the chances of success are for your plan with God's purpose. So as we move out of this first message here, I want to give you some steps, some practical things, okay? First of all, move away from what is discouraging you, what is robbing you of your courage. Maybe that what is a who. I think about this group as they travel together and I think, did they start off 10 and 2? Or or was there a discouraging, cynical, negative, toxic personality who managed one by one by one to pick off those who were not of a different spirit and wholehearted? Um, One of my favorite books is a book called Willpower Doesn't Work. If you've ever beat yourself up for like not having enough willpower, you need to read this book because it's all about environment and how actually environment has been shown to have much more impact on our success than our willpower or our self-discipline. So for everybody who's like, I just need more self-discipline, turns out you may just be putting yourself around the wrong people or in the wrong environment. And one of the things that they did in this book, I love books that are based on research and studies, and they actually did a study where they convinced a company to allow them to insert an actor into the corporate environment. So this is a professional actor that they paid to be as negative and as cynical as he could possibly be about everything in the workplace environment. And then they convinced this company to allow them to insert this negative, cynical person into the environment and see what the effect would be. And what they were curious to study is, who would be most impacted? Would it be the people who'd been at the company the least amount of time? Would it be the people who already sort of lean toward a negative mindset? Like who exactly would be impacted by this negative mindset? It turned out that you literally could use a tape measure at the end of the study and you could measure the distance from that person's desk to other people's desks in the building. And the closer they were in physical proximity to the toxic personality, the more likely they were to answer negatively 
on the employee satisfaction survey at the end of the three-month period they did this study. It's fascinating. Just physical proximity. It had nothing to do with how long you'd been at the company and there were all these other factors they thought it would, but no. Turns out being around negative people is not good for your soul. It's not good for your wholeheartedness. So maybe you need to move away from discouraging influences. And then move toward the Caleb's. I think that it's fascinating that Joshua is actually the one that ends up leading Israel after Moses. But Joshua is the one that is specifically called out in Numbers 14 for being of a different spirit and wholehearted. And, and why God chose Joshua to be the, the leader of Israel after Moses, you know, we, we're not given all the answers to that. But I think that Caleb around that campfire was the one who just continued to say, my God is faithful. My God is powerful. My God can solve these problems. I have been given authority in the name of my God. My God has given us this land. All we have to do is receive it. I don't have to fight for it. I don't have to work for it. God has given me something. And I think that as you're seated around the campfire, it's not just enough to move away from the toxic people. I think you need to kind of scoot up next to Caleb. You need to identify who are the Caleb's in your life? Who is speaking words of life and truth and encouragement and courage to you? Who is encouraging you? And move toward them. Ask God to give you a different spirit. Say, God, I don't, I don't know where to start because I'm caught up in the negative, but I just need you to give me a different spirit and then give God your whole heart. Give God your whole heart. One of my best friends um, about two years ago had a massive heart attack. And as he was being rushed in the ambulance, they realized that they were not going to make it to the hospital in time. And so they, they pulled into a church parking lot and they offloaded him from the ambulance and put him into a helicopter to life flight him to the hospital. And he was telling me a few months later as we were together, just the, all that went through his mind as the helicopter was lifting off and he's flying out over the mountains toward the hospital and he thought about his life and his family. And one of the things that went through his mind was this idea of like, God, I, I, I finished well. I didn't, I didn't drop the ball with my kids. I didn't drop the ball with my marriage. I didn't drop the ball with my business. I finished well. Caleb and Joshua went on to lead Israel for another 45 years. And it's really cool to see how the rest of their story plays out. But the reality is that these 10, they were selected as leaders, man. They were the 40 under 40, but they peaked early. It's not how you start. And it's not even how high you rise. It's how you finish. Can you hang in there? Can you keep the faith? Can you keep the fight? Can you stay encouraged? Can you finish well? If you fast forward all the way through to the beginning of the book of Joshua, Joshua now, it's 40 years later because the nation of Israel didn't listen to Joshua and Caleb. It was two men against an entire nation, 75,000 people that wouldn't listen to them. And so God said, you know what? I had a promise for you, but I can't give you that promise yet. And so he sent them out into the desert for 40 years until that entire generation died off and their children then were able to inherit the promise. And of that first generation, only Joshua and Caleb get to go into the promised land with the nation of Israel. And when they're about to cross the Jordan, when they're about to go into this land that God has given them, Joshua says, to the people, 
be strong and courageous. For you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Don't be frightened. Don't be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. For the Lord God is with you wherever you go. Be strong, be courageous, all the way to the end. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for all of the truth wrapped up in this story. And it's like we just barely touched it today. But I ask that you would allow it to speak to our hearts that we would be of a different spirit and wholehearted toward you. We ask all of this in your name. Amen. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, if you're new to Access,